Okay. It's a tough act to follow of four shiurim in a row. This, this coming shiur is going to be about Hafni and Pinchas. Um, it's not that same Pinchas that we spoke about earlier. Big disclaimer, they're not the same person. In fact, uh, quite different. First of all, I'd just like to uh, thank Jeffrey Silver for this dedication, which was dedicated in appreciation of uh, someone in the Beit Midrash for being such a great chavruta and for all he does for Bayit. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, th th those of you who are here and uh, have source sheets next to you or have the source sheets open on Facebook and appreciate that a little bit more. The first thing is to sort of get into the context that Chafni and Pinchas are in. Where does this story come up before we actually get into what happens? Where this happens is actually right towards the beginning of Sefer Shmuel. Sefer Shmuel, of course, is about Shmuel. Um, and if you look at the first parak and the bit before we're going to jump in, it's the story that we read on Rosh Hashanah, the story of Hannah, how Hannah is answered by God and her cries and her pleas, and she finally has this son named Shmuel, and she gives him to Eli HaKohen to be under his guidance in the Beis HaMikdash. And at that point, she leaves him behind, and we will actually see some first in our story still relating to Shmuel's mother and father, but they are leaving him there um, to learn from Eli and those around him in, the, in Mishkan Shiloh. So that's sort of where we begin this story. Now, very interestingly, um, let's jump first of all to the first source, source number one, which we're going to be reading large chunks of text, so I apologize, from uh, Shmuel 1, chapter 2, which is on page 648. Um, so not long after you guys just finished in Shoktim. So this is chapter 2, verse 11. Okay, so we've just finished, you know, our, our Haftarah on Rosh Hashanah morning, and now we move on to the next part of Shmuel. And here it begins. Vayelach Elkanah Haramas al Beso. Elkanah returns home to his house. Vehana'ar, and the young man, the boy, Hayam Mishareses Hashem es Pnei Eli HaKohen. He served Hashem before Eli. So this is referring, of course, to Shmuel, who has just left with Eli. Now, who's little Shmulek left to be playing with? at this point. With Shmuel's, you know, a little boy, he comes to the base of Mikdash, let's hear about his friends. So here are his two friends. Uvne Eli, Eli's kids. Okay, they're there, obviously, if he's under Eli's tutelage, um, then Eli's sons are going to be hanging around. And you would think, Eli, a Cohen, a nice guy, so his sons must be great guys also. Wrong. Bnei Bilial. They were Bnei Bilial, and we'll get to that as soon as we finish the Pasuk, what that might mean. Lo yadu es Hashem. Okay, they did not recognize Hashem. So that's pretty sharp in and of itself. I figured, as I did in some of my earlier shiur, and let's look where this phrase might appear elsewhere in Tanakh. And I came up with two places which encompass all of the three cardinal sins. So, source number two on the sheet is from Radak. Radak explains B'nai Belial here, and he says, B'nai Resha, they're sons of evil, uvidrash banim shebalu shim shemaim me'alehem, sons who... The name of heaven was worn out from them. Amru, they said, There's no kingdom in heaven. That's why it says they did not know God. They didn't believe in God. They were not only not God-fearing, they didn't even believe that God existed. Okay, alternatively, he says another possibility. He says the other alternative is they did not know God. It's not that they didn't believe in God, per se, but rather that they simply didn't know what God wanted from them because they were acting in such an evil fashion. And what is this evil fashion? Radak says, hold up, it's going to be explained in just a little bit. And again, to sort of get an idea of what Bnei Belial means, let's look at source number three. If you flip back in your Tanakhs to Sefer Devarim, which is page 460 to 463, which is Devarim 1314. Okay. 
we'll jump down, we'll, we'll begin at verse 13 at the bottom of the page, 13, 13, at the bottom of page 460. And it says as follows. When you hear, if in one of your cities that Hashem your God gives you in which to in which to dwell, you hear saying, Lawless men have emerged from your midst, and they have caused the dwellers of your city to go astray. Saying, Elohim Achirim Asher Let's go and worship the gods of others that you have not known. And then if you find out about it as it continues, you are told to wipe out this entire city. This is the case of what we know as a Yer Hanidachat. Okay, so this is idol worship. So we know B'nai Belial are bad, bad people. They're lawless, and in this case, they are worshippers of Avodazara. But it, it doesn't stop there. If you go back to what we had just concluded in Shoftim, and you go to the story of Tilagash Begiva, which is at the end of Shoftim, and that's going to be page 634. You can jump there as well. For those of you who don't have an R scroll Tanakh, it's Shoftim 1922. 634. And it says in the Pasuk there, and we'll read the English translation. Well, as they were feeling merry, behold, the people of the city, lawless people, surrounded the house, banging on the door, and they said to the old man, the owner of the house, send out the man who came to your house so that we may know him. And this was not just simply, hi, how are you type of knowing. This was the same type of knowing that we have in the story of Saddam. This was of a sexual nature, completely inappropriate. And then as you see, the story goes on, where it says, the only of the house says, no, 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 he hasn't done anything. I will send out instead my, da my daughter. And he sends out his concubine as well. And the whole story of what happens at Pilagish Begiva, which includes, unfortunately, terrible sins of various types, um, comes from this because of, we have these, again, lawless people. So when we say B'nai Eli or B'nai Belial, this is what the Pasuk is coming to tell us about them. So we haven't started off on a very good leg. And as we return, let's continue up in Shmuel, back again on page uh, 648. So what were they doing? So here's what would happen in verse 13. And now I'll start reading from the English. This was the practice of the Kohanim with the people. What would the sons of Eli do? When any person would slaughter a sacrifice, the Kohen's attendant would come while the meat was cooking with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would thrust it into the pot or the cauldron or the pan or the kettle and everything the fork would bring up, the Kohen would take with it. So they're coming in as soon as people have brought their karbanos and just sticking in their forks to the pot, taking whatever meat they want. Now, Kohanim are entitled to some meat, this was certainly not being done in the proper way, but even more than that. This is what they would do with all the Israelites who had come there to Shiloh, which is where they were serving, even before they would burn the fat upon the altar, which was something that had to be done before anybody takes anything from the carbon. The Kohen's attendant would come and say to the man who was bringing the offering, give some meat for roasting for the Kohen. He will not take cooked meat from you, but only raw meat. They'd come in in this rude fashion, say, I want my meat now. And it's not even his meat, right? This was being taken lawlessly. This was not something that it was appropriate for them to be taking, certainly not at this stage in their proceedings. And you know what would happen? The man would say, hold up, wait, let them first burn the fat upon the altar and then take for yourself whatever your soul desires. But the attendant would say, no, give it now or else I'll take it by force. Okay, these, these were, again, uh, not the nicest of people. And as you can see, there's just one bad mida piled on top of another bad mida and what they're doing and how they're demanding this. And in fact, the Pasuk tells us as it continues and we turn to page 650 or verse 17, the sin of the attendants was very great before Hashem for the men had disgraced Hashem's offering. So God is really unhappy with this. Not only is it mean to people, but it's mean to God as well. Who are you to take of my offerings before you are supposed to be in this fashion? Certainly, uh, this was very, very bad. Okay, this is 217. Now, if we jump down a little bit, we have a little bit of a... Um, you know, an inserted parsha about Shmuel. Okay, remember that this is, again, who Shmuel is friends with. This is who he's hanging around with. 
it's you know not not the greatest group unfortunately but the Eli came out if we skip forward to verse 22 Eli became very old he heard about all that his sons were doing to all of Israel what were they doing says the pasuk in Hebrew first and then in English that they would lie with the women who congregated at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So you thought it was bad when they were just stealing stuff from Korbanos, right? It gets a whole lot worse. They're really trying to live up to their names, aren't they? B'nai B'lial. And anyways, Eli decides, you know, I think I got to speak to my kids. Bayomer lahem, lama ta'asun kadvarim ha'ele. Says, first of all, everybody's complaining about you. The feedback forms that I sent out that got sent back, nobody likes you. But also that, he says, you know, know my sons. Says the report that I hear, Hashem's people passing on is not good. And he tells them, if man sins against man, a judge tries him. But if he sins against Hashem, who can speak in his defense? There are different ways of interpreting this. You know, obviously the simplest way is that you're sinning against God as well. Never mind the terrible things you're doing to people. So shape up. Okay, however, what do you think happens with people like this? But they would not listen to their father's voice for Hashem desired to kill them. These people, they were not listening. And you know what? God said enough is enough. They're not listening. They're not interested in getting any better. Let's forget about them. Okay. And all in the meanwhile, again, And the most amazing part of this is what? Shmuel, who's hanging, Shmuel, who's hanging around the entire time, is not influenced by them. He's sitting around, but he's good not only with God, but even with people, which is even more incredible. Okay. At this point, um, you know, God's had enough. A man of God comes to Eli and says to him in verse 27, Thus said Hashem, did I not appear to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt, enslaved to the house of Paro, and choose him from among all the tribes of Israel to be a Kohen to me, to ascend my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And didn't I give your ancestors' family all the fire offerings of the children of Israel? And this man of God says to Eli, Why do you scorn my sacrifice and my meal offering, which I have commanded to be brought in my dwelling place? And you honor your sons more than me, to fatten yourselves from the choicest parts of all the offerings of Israel before my people. And this is being yelled at Eli because his sons are doing all these terrible things. And you know what? His little bit of rebuke was not enough, as we're going to see here and elsewhere. And the psukim continue. Therefore, this is the word of Hashem, God of Israel. I had indeed said that your family and your father's family would walk before me forever. But now the word of Hashem, far be it for me to do so. For I honor those who honor me and those that scorn me will be accursed. Behold, days are coming when I shall cut off your arm and the arm of your father's family from there being any old person in your family. Basically, you're all going to die out. And you will see a rival coin in my dwelling place throughout all the good times that he will bring upon Israel. But there will be no old people in your family for all time. But I will not completely cut off any of your men from upon my altar to make your eyes pine and your soul sad. And all those that raised in your house will die as young men. And this will be the sign what's going to happen. The evildoers will be killed in what way? That with that which will befall your two sons, Chafni and Pinchas, they will both die on the same day, and I will appoint for myself a faithful Kohen, which is going to be Tzadok Kohen, um, from a slightly different branch of the Kohanic family. Um, but basically, Chafni and Pinchas, God's had enough of them. He says, I'm going to kill them out on the same day. This is going to be my sign that your branch of the family is not going to be, you know, the Kohanim really working at the base of Mekdash. And as you continue here through all of the various psukim, you see what's you know, going to take place and how it takes place, etc. Now, at this point, we begin chapter three of Shmuel, and it talks about Shmuel actually getting called by God to give prophecy. He doesn't really know what's going on. Eli kind of directs him a little bit. Um, and if we skip to verse 11 on page 652, and we go down there, so finally, once Shmuel realizes how to answer the phone call, essentially in, in verses 1 through 10, um, it's, you know, God calling and Shmuel says, I don't know how to pick up the phone here. And Eli's like, you press the talk button. That's basically what goes on here, but you can have a look for yourself. You know what? I'm going to do such a thing in Israel that when anyone hears about it, both his ears will ring. 
On that day I will fulfill for Ailey all that I have spoken concerning his house, beginning to destroy. I have told him that I'm executing judgment against his house forever for the sin he committed, that he was aware that his sons were blaspheming themselves and he did not censure them. Therefore, I have sworn concerning the house of Ailey that the sin of the house of Ailey would never be atoned for by sacrifice or meal offering. And Ailey accepts it in the next part. Finally, we get around to the action. Um, here we go in chapter 4, in verse 1, again, still on 652. Here's what happened. The word of Samuel befell all of Israel. Israel went out to war against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer while the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines arrayed themselves opposite Israel and the battle spread. And Israel gets slaughtered on the battlefield. Israel was smitten before the Philistines. They slew about 4,000 men in the battlefield. The people came to the camp and the elders of Israel said, Why did Hashem smite us today before the Philistines? Let us take with us from Chilo the Ark of the Covenant of Hashem, that he may come in our midst and save us from the hands of our enemies. They say, it doesn't make sense, the people say, the elders of the nation say. How is it that we're getting beaten by this Plishtim? You know what? Let's go and get the Aron, the Aron Brit Hashem, God's Ark of the Covenant. So they send to Shilo, or who's servicing at Shilo? Chafni or Pinchas, our two best friends. So the people sent to Shiloh and carried from there the Ark of the Covenant of Hashem, Master of Legions, who dwells atop the Kerubim. And the two sons of Eli, Chafni and Pinchas, were there along with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of Hashem arrived at the camp, all of Israel sounded a great chauffeur blast, and the ground shook. This is very exciting. The Aaron is here. It's going to save us in battle, right? And in fact, the Philistines heard the sound of the blast, and they said, what is the sound of this great blast in the camp of the Hebrews? And they became aware that the Ark of Hashem had come to the camp. The Philistines were afraid, as they said, God has come to the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing had not happened yesterday or the day before. Woe to us, who will save us from the hands of this mighty God? This is the God who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. And they say, you know what, we're going to fight them though anyways. The Philistines say, yes, let's go to battle, and here they come. Be strong, be men, O Philistines lest you become enslaved to the Hebrews as they have been enslaved to you. Be men and fight. And guess what happens? The Philistines fight. Israel was smitten and they ran every man to his tents. The blow is very great. 30,000 foot soldiers fell from Israel. The Ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Pinchas, died. Okay, so they get killed together. They were the ones tending to the Aaron. Not only is the Aaron captured, one tragedy in and of itself, certainly, but Chafni and Pinchas are both slain, as was predicted. Basically, they come to Eli with this news. Eli hears that again, not only is the Aaron guy, is the Aaron now captured, but his two sons have been killed. Eli dies from the news. Okay, that's what happens down there. The man said to Eli, I'm the one who came from the battlefront. And I ran from the battlefront today in verse 16 here on page 654. Eli said, what's the report, my son? The bearer of the tidings answered him, saying, Israel ran from the board of the Philistines, and there was a great blow amongst the people. And also your two sons, Hophni and Pinchas, died, and the ark of God was taken, and he falls off his chair, breaks his neck, and uh, that's very, very sad. Pinchas, his wife, gives birth, um, and she is also dying in childbirth, essentially, when she hears the news. She hears the news, she actually goes into labor, um, and then at that point, she calls the boy Ikavot, saying, Glory has been exiled from Israel. There is no glory. There is no honor. The ark is gone. Her father-in-law is dead. Her husband's dead. Her brother-in-law is dead. It's a big, big mess. And that's where we end our story. So, I think that from what we've seen so far, first of all, Chafni and Pinchas are, are pretty clearly very bad people. I, and I think that's an understatement. And they really get what's coming to them, right? They're told, they're warned this was going to happen. They do terrible things and they get repaid in turn. And that's the way the story should end. But the Gemara has a very, very strange statement, twice actually in the Gemara, one time in Shabbos, which we'll start with in source number five. And the Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, or Shmuel Bar Nachmeni says, Amar Rabbi Yonatan, Kol HaOmer B'nei Eli Chatu, Eino El Anybody who says that Chafni and Pinchas, the two sons of Eli, sinned, is completely mistaken. <laughs> that they were with the Aaron, they were Kohanim Ta'ashem. 
Okay? Stavar la karav da amarav pinchas lochata, makish chap mila pinchas, ma pinchas lochata, chap mila lochata, elamani mikayin, asherish kavunis hanashim. So basically, what the Gemara says, you know what? Anybody who thinks Chafni and Pinchas sinned is wrong. You're mistaken. They didn't sin. Huh? Okay. And says the Gemara, well, it comes because first we know that uh, Pinchas didn't sin, so we compare Chafni to Pinchas. And the, the point of the Gemara is actually to say, look, we see that they are Kohanim la Hashem, they are guarding the Aaron. We can't say that they sinned in this way. So the Gemara asks, are you kidding me? Well, what about the Psukim? It says, Eli heard, Asher yishkipunas hanashim, he tells you. But it says that they slept with the women. How can you get around that? It says it directly in the psukim. Says the Gemara, no, no, no. Mi tov shashahu es kinehen, shalo hachu eitzel ba'alehen male alehen ha'kasuv ki'ilu shachbum. Says the Gemara. The sons of Eli were supposed to be the ones sacrificing bird offerings for women who wanted to return to their husbands after giving birth um, or other times. And they used to bring different birds as korbanos before they could go back, before they could become pure again in the purification process. And Chafni and Pinchas were lazy. They delayed bringing it some of the time. They weren't that fast to bring the birds. I mean, if they were getting meat from all the animals, they didn't need the birds so fast. Um, and uh, anyways, so that's why, says the Gemara, the, to- the, the Navi says, it's as if they slept with the women because they delayed them in going home to their husbands. And that's what the verse means. Still very, very strange. And it's true, Rashi and, and Tosfas note here that um, this is only referring to the sin of the sleeping with the women. Certainly the Gemara does not dispute the fact that they acted inappropriately with the various korbanos, but still. And if we read the Gemara next, there are those who say, many Rishonim say, the next Gemara disagrees with this. Amar Yochanan ben Turta, in source number six. Okay, Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta says, Mipnei why was Mishkan Shilo destroyed? Says the Gemara, divarim. There were two bad things that happened that led to its destruction. Here they are, giloy arayos, again, forbidden sexual relations, uvizayon kachim, and uh, the degradation of consecrated items, meaning again, they were acting inappropriately with the korbanos. Giloy arayos dixiv, ve'eli zakin me'od v'shamais, kol asher ya'asun v'anav v'chay Yisrael v'yisashir yishkivun esan, nashim atzavos. Pesach Ohel Moed, which seems to be taken literal. So these were the forbidden sexual unions that Eli's sons were with married women who were waiting in the in the Mishkan at that point. And number two is the Bizayon Kachim, which we have various psukim for over there. However, says the Gemara, V'af al Gav, and even though the Amar of Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, that our Shmuel Bar Nachmeni said, which is the previous source in the Gemara that we just saw, as we said before, I, what about the Shmuel Bar Nachmeni who says they didn't sin? They would say, well, according to him, this can be substituted. This was the substitute sin. Whether you want to substitute it in the Pasuk and say when the Pasuk says they slept with the women, it just means they delayed their sacrifices, or whether you want to say that that's the reason that Mishkan Chilo was destroyed, it doesn't matter. You can substitute it in. And in source number seven, I quote you Rav Amnon Bazak, um, a translated shir, um, who makes the very, very clear observation that's bothering us all. He says, this is a strange midrash. Thus far, we have seen that there is a tendency to defend biblical figures against accusations that they sinned, even when such defense goes against the plain meaning of the text. But what sort of interest is there in defending Chofni and Pinchas, who are characterized quite plainly in the text as worthless men, B'nai B'lial, and whose actions are recorded in great detail? What's the point? When the Gemara wants to defend one of the Shvatim, or one of the Avos, or whatever it is that's going on, we get it. They're really, really great people. But B'nai Eli are the worst of the worst. They're B'nai B'lial. They're doing terrible things. They have terrible mitos. They're doing Avera after Avera knowingly. They get rebuked. They don't listen. Why does the Gemara want to defend them? And I'd like to look very, very quickly at two more Mepharshim to help us answer this question. If you look um, back to Shmuel 113, which if you had on the first, we had on the first page, smack in the middle there, the 650s. Um, so that is on page 652.
Okay, and in the English here we read, I have told him that I'm executing judgment against his house forever for the sin he committed, that he was aware that his sons were blaspheming themselves and he did not censure them. Meaning we are blaming Eli for not taking enough responsibility over his children. What does it mean, kimikalim bahem banav? They were, they were blaspheming themselves. So Rashi quotes what Chazal said, which is that mikalalim liha yalo lomar. God was going to say that they were cursing me. Ela shekina katub. This is one of the slight adjustments to tikkun esofrim. Um, it should properly say blasphemy, but scripture euphemized in order to not say that God would be cursed. God would be blasphemed because that was inappropriate. But here's the next part. What does it mean, mikalalim lahem banav, says Rashi? What does it mean they were mikalalim, they were blaspheming, they were cursing? Says Rashi, mikilim. Vechin kol klala lashon kalut uvizayonu. They acted irreverently. They didn't care. They were making light of the situation. It didn't bother them that all these things were happening. It didn't bother them that people were not able to return home to their husbands. It didn't bother them that they were taking food and that people were saying, what are you taking my food? It didn't bother them all they were doing. They didn't care. And if you look at Rabag, similarly, says his sons were bringing a curse upon themselves and he did not rebuke them. The meaning of this is that Ailey knew that the Israelites were cursing his sons because of the extortion they committed. Ailey knew that everybody in the Jewish people were saying, they're not nice people. And he didn't do anything about it. And at face value, what is this that God's saying, you know, you knew that they weren't being careful, they um, were acting irreverently. Say, you knew they were terrible people. They were sinning against everybody in the worst possible way. Why is this what God is telling Ailey that he's being punished for? And perhaps... The answer to that is to take the Gemara and the question that we have and to flip it on its head. When the Gemara is telling us that they didn't sin and telling us that they didn't commit the terrible Averus that they did, what then does Tanakh tell us when the Pasuk says, Asher Yishkevunas Anashim? What then does Tanakh tell us when it tells us that they took from the Karbanos in this lawless way? It's telling us that even those minute actions, that irreverence, they're not caring about other people. The little bad midos, Tanakh is saying that is as bad, that is on the same level as if they would be sleeping with the women and if, if they would be doing all of these terrible things as exactly described in detail. Not to look at it as saying, oh, we're whitewashing them. No, we're telling you even the little things that they did, even just annoying everybody else and bothering everybody else, taking little things, delaying people from getting home, that type of stuff says the Gemara, is what Tanakh refers to when it talks about it. And this is to tell us that sometimes, you're right, if you look at it from one perspective in the Gemara, it's, it's, it's putting them off the hook. Here we're saying, no, it's even worse. Whatever they did, we don't know. We weren't there. That's why there's a machlokas in between, possibly, certainly Rishonim, but even in the Gemara. But the point to finish with is to say that even those little things of just not caring so much, and, you know, I'll be a little bit lazy today. I won't get the korbanos completed now. That's enough to say that they're b'nei b'li'al. That's enough to have them really deserving of death. And that is perhaps the message the Gemara is trying to teach us when it says that these sins weren't literal, but rather watered-down versions, to say that even a watered-down version is negative enough on its own. Thank you.